Okay, um, a very good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Shetland Museum and Archives. My name is Martin Henry. I'm a professor of astrophysics from Glasgow University, and it's my pleasure to host you this evening as we have an event that will take us to the dark side of the universe. Um, our special guest is Professor um, Alex Murphy from the University of Edinburgh. And more than that in a moment, uh, let me just say that we're here and principally reading a slightly different class. Uh, we're both fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and that's Scotland National Academy, and of course, the Sciences, the Arts and Humanities. It's an organisation that seeks to bring together the best minds, the best thinkers, and the best experts across those fields um, to share our knowledge, and both amongst ourselves, but more importantly, with the rest of the country. And its, it's motto is knowledge made useful. So it's very firmly rooted in the principles for its founding days um, as part of the enlightenment that um, the knowledge that we acquire um, about the universe um, has many uses, both enriching our culture but also enriching our technology. And we'll hear about aspects of both of that from Alex this evening. Uh, Alex is an expert in the search for dark matter. And um, he's a professor of, um, I'll just turn my screen out so that I can actually read it. Uh, professor of Nuclear and Half Astrophysics at the University of Edinburgh, and he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, as I said. And um, he was awarded the British Science Association's Lord Kelvin Medal in Mathematical and Physical Sciences. And in, in talking about his research, it's important to distinguish between what he does above ground and below ground, because that will become evident in his presentation in a few minutes. So, above ground, um, he uses particle accelerators to explore the lives and deaths of stars, whereas the low ground, he builds the world's most sensitive instruments to search for dark matter. And he served on a number of the UK's senior science advisory boards, and he's a very keen enthusiast for public engagement in science. And that's principally why we're here, because in 2022, organized an online series of lectures for Shetland school pupils, both primary and junior and senior secondary. And that was as a result of the pandemic preventing us coming in person, because myself uh, and another colleague from Strathclyde University were lined up to visit Shetland in June 2020. Of course, that didn't happen. But we realized by switching the lectures to be online, we had the opportunity to expand the range of topics that we covered, bringing in friends and colleagues like Alex, and like and Catherine Havens, the Royal Astronomer for Scotland, and also seeking to link to the exciting new developments with the spaceport in Saxon So again, we're delighted to have our colleagues from there as well and this evening. And uh, indeed, it's been very interesting to explore with the school children these last two days their dreams and hopes and aspirations for what the spaceport might bring. It's safe to say that, you know, the secondary students will be a little bit more reticent about their willingness to, to buy into it all. But let's just say that the primary children, they want to go to Mars. So they might have to go keep their feet on the ground and then just to come. So the other reason we're here this evening is not just to learn about tools from the dark side and to learn about dark matter, but to make an award because Alex's enthusiasm for public engagement in science is also matched by his talent as an outstanding communicator and the range and depth of audiences that he's reached over many years. So for that reason, we're delighted to recognise those achievements by awarding him the Senior Public Engagement Prize of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And um, I was greatly honoured to receive this myself some years ago, so it's a really nice story up for me, all these years later, to have the chance to give the awards to Alex in my role as Vice President for Public Engagement of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So, a great pleasure, can I call up a we can invite you to say a few words, but we're actually going to invite you to say a lot of words because maybe equally important, I'm not going to hand over to Alex, the laser pointer, because she's going to spend a bit of time. But I'm totally so good at safe. During the next 20 minutes or so, as Alex is going to give us an introductory talk on the search for that matter, his tales from the dark side, and then I will join him on stage for some Q&A, but that is very much an invitation to all of you to ask questions, but I have a few my sleeve just in case. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Alex Murphy. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a, it's a delight and an honour and a privilege to be here, uh, and especially so to be awarded this medal by Martin, who's a um, 
ton of them. I'm a bit of a fanboy, not too many others. I want to tell you about a version of astronomy which is somewhat different from the normal type of astronomy. Normally you go to a telescope, you look up, up in the stars, you see, see stars, planets, galaxies, whatever. Um, this is a type of astronomy where we go, first of all, we go a mile underground to start with. Um, why would you do that? I'm going to try and explain it then. Okay, Martin came up with this title, um, Tales from the Dark Side. I looked online and it turns out there's a, a US horror series, a bit like Tales from the Unexpected. This is called Tales from the Dark Side. Uh, this is not a horror story, um, but the, it is quite nice. I'll, I'll say this in a moment, but really, dark matter should be called invisible matter. That's a much better name for it. But the title of dark matter seems to generate a lot more interest publicly, which is great. Okay, what am I going to talk about here? I'm going to tell you, or try to end you, why do we think there's dark matter in the universe? I will hopefully tell you what dark, uh, dark matter might be. Um, I will tell you about the kind of research that I get involved in. There are other ways of trying to find the dark matter as well. The way we do it is direct detection of dark matter. And I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming next. Um, where did this all start? Well, <coughs> just like pretty much well, an awful lot of stuff, it started with Lord Kelvin, um, astonishing scientist. Uh, and it's difficult now to appreciate the superstar he was. He was kind of like um, Brian Cox on steroids, kind of thing. It was, he was an amazing scientist, quite controversial in some ways, certainly not always right. <coughs> a lot of really good stuff, um, obviously. Uh, coming from Glasgow. Um, I'm going to mention this, this chap, some scary looking guy, um, Omri Punkai. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, I mentioned him because he came up with the name uh, Dark Matter. It was not this guy who's Fritz Wicke, who he was a, um, keep pressing the wrong button, my apologies, um, a, a Swiss astronomer working in the US principally. Quite a controversial man. Um, he was, uh, but he was also. I would argue, one of the most brilliant scientists of all time. I, I, I rank, rank, personally, I rank him up there with Einstein, frankly. Um, the list of his scientific achievements and his thought processes is just astonishing. There's so much in astronomy and physics that, uh, and engineering and uh, space flight and uh, working at the, if, if we ever do um, travel to Mars, uh, we don't want to contaminate Mars with stuff from Earth. Um, he wrote the uh, protocols for how we do that. Um, he's just a, an astonishing range of vision. But he was also such a controversial person, I could explain a little bit more, it's a little bit rude at times, um, that nobody liked him, so he never got Nobel Prizes. And the last person I want to mention is also a brilliant superstar, uh, Vera Rubin. Um, went to Princeton, um, and I think she was not allowed into Princeton because they don't take women. Um, went somewhere else and was supervised by uh, other great, great names in physics. They really recognised her talent. Um, she was uh, uh, kind of snuck into telescopes uh, to, to be able to um, do her work. And it's down to her that, I guess I didn't say what Zwicky did, I, I will mention that in a moment really. Um, he provided some of the first really good evidence for dark matter. Nobody believes him, his name was Suki. Um, Vera went away and did it as studious work and really came up with the evidence that nailed it and we now all believe it. Um, and as I guess I should also mention, um, there's a, an enormous great new telescope coming online very soon, uh, named in honour of Vera Rubin. So uh, let's start off. Why do we think there's this dark matter in the universe? So I'm going to try and do this rather than starting with astrophysics and kind of blow you away with your minds, let's do something a little bit more straightforward, hopefully. What can you see here? Okay, what you're seeing is a bunch of trees blowing around in the wind, um, and they're kind of stepping around because the uh, speed isn't so great. But what are we actually seeing here? We are seeing leaves on trees moving around. What, does, what can we tell from that? Well, the, leaf, the leaves on the trees <coughs> don't spontaneously move around by themselves. They're being blown around by the wind. So even though you can't see it, we know that the wind is there because of the impact it's having on something that we can see. And that's exactly the principle that we use to uh, see that there's dark matter in the universe. We look at the stars, 
and the galaxies, and we see those moving around. And the only way, to, the best way to interpret how they're moving around is to understand that there's something else that we can't see, which is the dark matter, which is causing them to move around. So even though we can't see it, the movement of the leaves will give us the presence of the air and the wind. Um, and even though we can't see it, the movement of the stars and galaxies uh, tells us that there's this other stuff there, dark matter. And a side note to this is that you can imagine chopping down all of these trees and leaves, putting, on some, putting them on some weighing scales and seeing just how, how heavy they weigh. Um, quite a lot, probably. But if you compare that to the weight of all of the air in the sky that's causing them to move around, all of that air would weigh more, substantially more. And that's exactly the same case with dark matter. Is that we can look at all the stars and galaxies and you can see how much they weigh, but the amount of dark matter that there must be in the universe to make all this stuff move around must actually be rather more than uh, all these stars and galaxies. Okay, so here's another little movie. This was actually published uh, two days ago. So it's really quite hot off the press. This is NASA with the James, space Web, James Webb Space Telescope. You probably heard a fair bit about it. It's having this fabulous um, machine showing us some beautiful data. Um, this is from the NIRCAM uh, um, cameras on board. Uh, this is the Milky Way, which is uh, kind of distorted because of the way the camera's working. And what we're going to do is have a pick a tiny spot of sky and zoom into it using uh, this telescope. As we look zooming in to this smaller, smaller and smaller patch on the sky, we're actually looking at um, further and further away into the universe. And one of the great discoveries from the um, 1930s is that the universe is expanding. Discovery from 1998 is that it's accelerating in that expansion, which is another complete mystery, um, really exciting stuff. Um, but as it's expanding, we get Doppler shift. You may have heard of that, the sound of a siren going past you, it sort of comes towards you, uh, increases in tone, goes away from you, and um, zooms away. Just the same way, light does that. And so the distant, distant stars that are moving away from us, all of this would start turning yellow and red, because you can actually <coughs> see that these things are all red shifted because they're so far away, they're moving away from us so fast. Is we zoom in to a picture of a galaxy. Um, and these galaxies at such great distances, pretty much they look just like the galaxies around us, except that a lot of them, you'll see them being really greatly distorted. And they're being distorted because of um, just, uh, just like um, well, matter, weight, material, distorts light. Light travels in straight lines, but because of general relativity, where you have matter, you distort space time, and light starts going in. It's still going in straight lines, but the space that it's involved in is bent and curved. That's coming from Einstein. And what we see is that this distortion is enormous. And the beauty of this is we'd see some galaxies which look completely, totally distorted, and the light is bent in really strange and wonderful ways. As you can see, we're zooming in, and yeah, pay attention to the changing colors that we start to see, which is just this. I think with the universe expanding faster and faster and faster, um, and things getting more and more literally redshifted, turning red, you can start seeing it now. It's just beautiful to see this as a scientist that all of these theories, you don't have to do all this clever mathematics any longer, you can just see it, a flipping picture of it, and just show it. It's wonderful. Um, okay, and then these are, most of these are now galaxies. They're so far away, you can't sort of see the details, but you start seeing there's a really nice galaxy over there. Here's a galaxy. This is gravitational lensing, uh, really dis distorting what we're seeing. And the amount of and matter can distort light, just like if you look at a little candle with a base of a wine glass, and you hold it there, you'll sort of see the, the light from the candle gets really distorted in the, in the lens of the light of the glass. This is gravitational lensing. And look at this galaxy, it's just completely distorted. And the, over here we've got these, these arcs that are Einstein arcs, it's just beautiful to see. Okay, this, if you try and do the mathematics of this and work out how could this have happened, you really need dark matter to make it to make the uh, it all work together. Oh, I guess the other thing to point out, I mean, again, just pause and think about what we're looking at here. This is a galaxy, it's, it's pretty much like our galaxy. I've got no idea which galaxy this is, but it's pretty much like ours, they're all roughly the same. That's a hundred to a thousand billion stars sitting there. 
Um, that's a hundred to a thousand billion stars, another hundred to a thousand billion stars. And this was some tiny little speck in the sky, the size of a smaller than a grain of sand held at arm's length. And you do that all over time. I mean, this universe is so enormous. Um, and it just makes me love this cartoon, which is if my work helps just one person feel like a tiny insignificant sketch lost in a cold, uncaring universe, then I'm doing my job. <laughs> but it's, it's really nice to just pause and think about what these, the implications are of what we're seeing here. Because it's, and I sort of show this with students and undergraduates and things, and sometimes you see a little light bulb go on and they just sort of suddenly, wow. And it, this is beyond everything that we see in science fiction. The science fact is more fun and exciting than the science fiction to my mind most of the time. Except for Star Wars. <laughs> okay, um, here's a closer galaxy. This is Andromeda, the largest close galaxy, the closest large galaxy to us. Um, and hopefully, just visually, you can see the stars laid out here. Um, you can just see visibly that it, this is something that's spinning. Um, you can do the Doppler shifts and you can look at how things are moving around and that confirms it. But you can see this is a whole bunch of stars spinning around in circles. Again, we can try and, instead of just looking at a pretty picture, we're going to use the laws of physics, do some mathematics. It's not that hard. People should not be scared of the mathematics and physics that are, that's involved in certainly the level of research that I do. Some of the stuff Martin does with gravitational waves, I, I'm terrified by it. <laughs> um, and try and work out what's going on. The, why are the stars going around the galaxy? Well, there's more stars in the middle than there are around the outside. So pick a star over here. On average, it's seeing lots of mass towards the center, and it's going around in a circle around that mass, basically. Um, we can look at, using the Doppler shifts, you can see how fast the stars are going around. This is exactly what Vera Rubin was doing. And work out, well, um, it's got a, technically, it's got a centripetal acceleration being attracted to the middle by the gravity, and we've got gravitational attraction uh, according to laws of Newton, or Einstein, if you want to update it a little bit, the result is pretty much the same. You can measure how fast the stars are going around, do the mathematics, and we find that the stars, all of them, in every galaxy that's like this, are going around faster than would make sense given the number of stars that are there. Every single time they're going around too fast. These are known as rotation curves. What does that mean? Well, okay, here's my star on the end of a going around the galaxy. If I want it to go around faster, we've seen them go around faster, I have to move it much further farther. And I can uh, I can start feeling that pressure in my hand. It's quite tight. There's, you need more force to make something go around faster. That more force, where does the force come from? It comes from gravity. We need more gravity than we can see from all the stars. That extra stuff is the dark matter. That's the principal uh, evidence that we have for dark matter. Okay, well, it's one of the forms of dark evidence for dark matter. Um, that's the main one that Vera Rubin came up with. Uh, previous to that, Zwicky did the same calculations, basically, but looking at clusters of galaxies going around one another. So instead of looking at the stars in a galaxy, he looked at lots of galaxies going around sort of their own common <coughs> centre of mass. Um, way back when, uh, um, Lord Kelvin basically did it for our galaxy. He didn't realise what he was doing, but the conclusions he came to were basically the same ones as uh, Vera Rubin was doing. Okay, um, so we've got, if we do this maths, we really don't want too many equations, we've got a force, we, we need a, a force pulling the star around in a circle, that's being provided by gravity. Uh, you can do the mathematics, and uh, there must be more matter to provide the equals in gravity. We can't see it, so it's called dark. Like I said, better name would be invisible. And exactly this mathematics and this concept, this is first year undergraduate physics that I teach at the University of Edinburgh. And this is, uh, there are, I don't, don't want to go into too much detail, there are alternatives to the, this concept of dark matter. Principally, what it would mean is that our laws of gravity must be incorrect. But I've shown you two bits of evidence for dark matter. One looking at um, very, very distant galaxies which get hugely distorted, and very, very close galaxies where the stars are going around in circles. These are completely different scales. They're also taking place at completely different times in the universe. Andromeda is right next to us. 
Those distant stars are billions of light years away. And yet they give exactly the same answers in terms of the amount of dark matter that they must be. To have such different types of evidence giving the same answer is really compelling. And the alternative models that involve modifying the laws of gravity at the moment can't uh, come up with a solution that, that works for all the different types of evidence that we have for dark matter. So we, the vast majority of astronomers and physicists are convinced by the case of dark matter, but who knows, we might be wrong. It's, it's, I'm completely happy with that as well. Um, it's this uncertainty. My job, hopefully, is to prove that the dark matter hypothesis is correct. Um, if it's wrong, well, that's science. We have to move on, we take the data, and we understand what, what happens with it. Okay, um, so we've got all this dark matter in the universe, we believe. So what, what are the contents of the universe? Well, this is what we think. <clears throat> this is our best model today, based on lots and lots of different types of evidence. All of the stuff that we're familiar with, the normal matter in the universe, making the stars, the planets, you, me, trees, fish, whatever else, that's made of normal matter, and it's this slice on this pie here, it's about 5% of everything that's in the universe. The dark matter, like I said, if you work out how much of it there must be, it's about five or six times as much. So it dominates the, uh, the universe. But then bizarrely, and only fairly recently discovered, is that there must be another third component to the universe, known as dark energy, which uh, I'm going to give you some clues as to what dark matter might be. We have really far poor understanding of what dark energy might be. More broadly, I'd say that the, the dark matter, the dark matter is the material that's, that we, we come up with its name for whatever it is that's causing galaxies to rotate faster than we're expecting. Whereas the dark energy is whatever it is that's causing galaxies at great distances to be expanding away from us ever faster and accelerating in their expansion. It's a very bizarre and un unexpected way that the universe behaves. It does that, all the evidence suggests so. Whatever it is that's causing that, but we call it dark energy. It's kind of a funky name, but we don't really know what dark energy is. We have, as I'm going to show you, I think we've got some fairly good ideas for what dark matter might be and how we might be able to see it. Okay, if we take all of this stuff, the matter of the universe, and we add it together, um, what is it? Well, of the normal matter, you get hydrogen and helium are the principal constituents of everything, really. Um, our sun is, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like 99.96 or something of the percent of all the matter in the solar system, and 75% of that is helium. It is hydrogen, sorry, hydrogen. The rest of it is basically helium. And the sun is slowly, slowly converting the hydrogen into helium through nuclear fusion. Everything else, all the other chemical elements, astronomers tend to call these metals. So it turns to an astronomer, oxygen is a metal and carbon is a metal. Very strange. That's uh, just everything other than hydrogen and helium. <coughs> um, and that's about half of 1% of everything that's in the uh, solar system, in the galaxy, and the universe. Then there's also these things called neutrinos, which are subatomic particles, as I'll mention those later. <coughs> um, well, these are, are kind of um, almost massless equivalents of the electron. Uh, they're whizzing around very fast. <coughs> and if you add up all of those things together, it turns out there's actually probably about as many of them, or as much weight in these as there is in, uh, in all the metals in the universe. But compared to all of that, dark matter just totally dwarfs it. Um, most of the most of everything that we know about must be this dark matter. So, okay, hopefully I've given you, maybe I've convinced you, but given you what we think is fairly compelling evidence for what that there is dark matter in the universe. But but what is it? What might it be? Okay, um, <clears throat> all of that evidence that I've talked to you about so far is looking at the universe on pretty large scales, galaxies, stars very dis distant galaxies and things. We're talking uh, mega light years, whatever distances. The answer, we go to completely the other end of the spectrum of size, and we start looking at the most smallest tiny things, fundamental particle physics. So what's this picture over here? This is known as the standard model of particle physics, and it's trying to depict the fundamental building blocks, blocks of everything in nature. 
I don't expect you to understand all of this or to even recognize most of it. You've probably heard of quarks um, and might possibly have heard of leptons. You probably know that there are four fundamental forces, which are with four, four different force carriers. And in here in the middle, that's the Higgs boson uh, discovered um, and proven to exist to great uh, excitement in 2014 at the LHC at CERN. Um, so, what are these things? Well, here I am still holding my um, ball. Suppose that's an atom. Well, we, hopefully, you're fairly familiar and happy with the concept of atoms. Atoms are, um, they've got nuclei, which are made of neutrons and protons, and they've got electrons in a cloud whizzing around, around the outside. That's fairly common stuff. Actually, that's the electron there. The electron, um, if we take one of those electrons, we can't put it apart any further. It turns out that the electron is just a, it is a fundamental particle. The neutrons and proton, okay, the atom in the middle has its nucleus. You can take a nucleus, carbon or something, put it apart, carbon 12, it's got six neutrons and six protons. Take one of those neutrons and I'll put it apart, and I can find, ultimately, you can find that they're, it's made of quarks and gluons. Here are the quarks, and there's the gluon. If we take one of those and try and pull it apart, it won't do so. As far as we know, those quarks are truly fundamental particles. Um, there's no further substructure to them. Uh, the gluon is a particle which seems to hold the quarks together in these uh, uh, neutrons and protons and things. The quarks, um, for some reason, it seems that there are six versions of a quark. There's up quarks, down quarks, strange quarks, charm quarks, top quarks, and uh, bottom quarks. Um, Okay, fair enough, we'll take that over as red, whatever. Um, there are electrons, and lots of exciting experiments have shown us that there are particles very similar to electrons, which are a bit heavier, the muon and the tau. The tau is actually an awful lot heavier, it's really very heavy. Then there are these other things called neutrinos, which seem to be paired with the electrons, muons, and taus. Again, you don't need to know what they are, they have maybe radioactive beta decay and things, fair enough. This symbol over here, that's a gamma symbol. That's indicating the photon, which is, you can see lots of photons around here. Thankfully, otherwise I wouldn't be giving a talk. And the W and Z, these are another kind of particle which is involved in the weak force of uh, radioactivity. And there's the Higgs boson. This is getting really complicated. Six, 12, 16, 17 fundamental particles. And they've all got an antiparticle, except the photon, which is its own antiparticle. Why? Why is it so complicated? No idea. We'd love to know. Um, someone can tell us that, that's a, a Nobel Prize, really waiting, to, waiting for it. Um, yeah, it's just, and why do these individual particles have the properties they do? Um, these things have uh, electrical charge, uh, Z0 doesn't have an electrical charge, why? Why does it come like that? Then why aren't there other particles? If you've got all these particles with the properties they do, they've all got very fixed values, why isn't there another particle with a different set of values? Don't know. Um, it, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. And the standard model of particle physics is you take basically take all of these and you've got given you recognize that they've all got the properties that they do, and taking that, you can then do fabulous calculations with it to predict all the properties of many, many other things, and it works beautifully well. But we don't know why the model has the features it does. Okay, I've rambled off into particle physics for a while. Why did I mention all of this? Well, let's get back to dark matter. Dark matter is it's invisible out there in the universe. For one reason or another, that's telling us that it cannot have an electromagnetic interaction, and it cannot have a strong interaction. You've possibly heard there's four fundamental forces, uh, the electromagnetic force, strong force, the weak force, and gravity. It definitely has gravity, that's why we know it's out there. Um, and we're pretty sure well, it can't have electromagnetic or strong force, because if it did, we'd see it. Andromeda, just nearby, is still going around um, much faster than uh, it should do if there was only the matter that we could see. So the dark matter is still there. Our galaxy does exactly the same. We do the same measurements for our own Milky Way. Dark matter is here right now. That means it's still here. It's stable. Um, it can't be a particle that decays on a time scale of less than uh, 10, 10 billion years or so. Something in the last 10 million years, I think of as pretty stable. 
And then, yes, these neutrinos have all the other properties that we need, but you can work out how many there are, and they're far, there's not nearly enough of them. They're, 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 don't worry nearly enough to make up the dark matter. So very quickly, you can start crossing off the particles that um, have that have these properties, and you very rapidly get to a stage where you've got a problem. <laughs> and this is why, okay, the dark matter, interesting, it explains a lot of astrophysics, but to my mind, the really interesting thing is that it's different. The existence of dark matter implies something utterly and completely new to science. It cannot be the same stuff as all the other matter that we know about in the universe. It just can't. It doesn't work. So, and it's, this is the stuff that makes up most of the matter in the universe, and it's different from everything we've seen. It's a, it's a fabulous concept. Who knows it might even be right? Um, let's try and find the answer. Okay, so. I've kind of told you what dark matter isn't, which is normal stuff. Let's try and tell you what it might be very, very briefly. Probably our best model for it is known as the WIMP. Some of the first models were thinking it might be this kind of the same material as, we normally, as normal matter is made of. And those are called massive compact halo objects, uh, acronym for which becomes MACHO. And it was fairly rapidly shown that you can make measurements of that and MACHOs can't work. And they came up with another theory, which they then just found called WIMPs. Um, and the W here is weakly. So I mentioned the four forces. Well, maybe they do have a weak interaction still. So it'd be weakly interacting, weakly interacting, massive particles. They're quite big and heavy, relatively. Okay, whatever that is. Another option might be something called the axion. Um, there's a different problem in particle physics uh, called the um, uh, CP violation. And to solve this problem, uh, a model was put together, which was, um, it cleaned up this problem. And something that cleans up problems is uh, a detergent in Italy called Axion Detergent. So because of that, it decided to call this model the Axion, and it stuck. Okay, so there's two models. What else might it be? Well, it might be, H oh, hang on, oh, Axion, oh, no, 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 there's lots of ideas. Okay, like I said, the best two are probably Wimps and Axions, but there's lots and lots of other ideas, even still some very vague ideas. Machos, fuzzy dark matter, gravitinos, dark photons, that's a particular favourite of mine, mirror dark matter as well. Um, possibly primordial black holes, black holes that were, so these things could be made of the normal matter, but it's got to have um, turned into a black hole and become invisible to the universe really, really early in the universe. Could that happen? Maybe LIGO's going to tell us, which is the work that Martin works on. Um, okay, so there's lots of options, and we really don't know which one it is, which is kind of embarrassing. This is 2023, we've got fabulous telescopes and detectors and everything else. We've learned so much about the universe, and yet we still don't know what most of it is made of. It'd be really nice if we could solve this. And I, I think one of the other things I'd really like to emphasize here is, okay, I've mentioned briefly the axion and strong CP problem. Um, there are other problems with the universe as well. Um, why is it expanding so fast? Uh, even more kind of more general things like quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a great theory. General relativity is a great theory, but the two of them don't work together. Something's wrong there. Um, maybe if we can solve one of these, it will give us a clue to solving a whole load, whole load more of them. That's really the goal, so that we can uh, start making progress in lots of different areas. Okay, so let's try and solve the dark matter problem. So let's try and detect the dark matter. The technique that I'm involved in is known as direct detection. It, it could have been called stupid detection. It's really a, a, a very brute force way of doing things. So I said that the dark matter is invisible to us. The principal idea is to make a detector which is so sensitive you can start seeing it. It's not much cleverer than that. You just make it more and more sensitive until you can see it. So we build a detector using pretty traditional techniques where we just make it really, really sensitive and critically, we have to get rid of all of the normal backgrounds that otherwise we would see um, because those will just mask what we're looking for. So we need to shield it from all the other types of radiation that are around us, um, which would otherwise mask the signal. What, where does the other radiation around us come from? Well, it comes from uh, distant 
supernovae exploding from our sun, from possibly accelerators and particles going all the way around galaxies and things. All of those together are known as cosmic rays, and they, uh, all the time we're being bombarded by cosmic rays from space. There's also our, um, the Earth uh, and the Sun. These formed from the debris from supernovae that went off billions of years ago. Um, and in that explosion that formed those things, roughly five billion years ago or something, there's a lot of radioactivity in that material, uranium and thorium. Uh, uranium and thorium have a lifetime of billions of years. So that material is still there, it's slowly decaying away, but everything here on Earth has got a little bit of contamination from uranium, thorium, potassium, still around because it's just that's not how long its half life is. And that means you and me, we all got radiation inside us. Um, each of us has roughly 5,000 radioactive decays of potassium 40 going on every second, just as we sit here. Um, it's not particularly dangerous, um, it's just natural radiation. Bananas, a bit of a favourite, they have lots of radiation in them. Relatively speaking, they have quite a lot of radiation in them. So much so that we've actually formed a, one of the units we use for measuring radioactivity is known as the banana equivalent unit. <laughs> we really are quite stupid at times. Uh, coffee beans have quite a lot of radiation in them. Um, 100 bananas, about 100 grams of, of Brazil nuts, and things, whatever, and coffee beans. And apparently, if you were to eat <coughs> a million bananas, you'd die of radiation, though. <laughs> But I think it died of eating 50 million bananas. <laughs> okay, um, so there's all this radiation. When we build our detector, the first thing we have to do is get away from that, those cosmic rays. They're difficult to get. You can't just, um, you need a lot of shielding material to get rid of them. How much material? Well, we go back a mile underground. It's a mile of rock, reduces that flux of cosmic rays by about a bit more than a million. And, and once we got rid of that amount of the cosmic rays, we can start doing the experiments that we're looking for. Uh, where do we do this? We used to do this in the Bombay mine in North Yorkshire. Um, our experiments essentially got too big and too expensive. We had to join with our uh, collaborators in the US, and we presently we're working in uh, the Sanford Underground Research Facility uh, in South Dakota, which is a, a lovely area of the world. Uh, has truly extreme winters and truly extreme summers at the other end of the spectrum. Um, here's one of the mine shafts, and another mine shaft. You go here and go down a mile, that's where you find a deep underground laboratory that you silence. Um, okay, so we've got a mile underground here with the cosmic rays. We then uh, build a really super, super sensitive detector. We're doing lots of clever things to try and get rid of as much of this radiation as we possibly can. That's an awful lot of the work that we do is try to find radioactively pure materials or or remanufacturing materials so as to take out all of this uranium and thorium. You can never get rid of all of it, we get rid of it as much as we can. Um, and then we do clever bits of analysis techniques and things to um, get rid of the events that are left. And what does the detector look like? Well, it's not, I'm not going to tell you about all the details of it, but it turns into a very pretty, beautiful object. Um, and here it is, uh, pretty much finished. It's just, it goes inside a um, titanium cryostat uh, within this, but uh, is the, um, this is about three meters tall, uh, and so it's about twice the height of a human, roughly, and it's filled with 10 tons of liquid xenon, which is a, uh, a noble element, atomic number 54, atomic mass 130-ish, because we've got various different uh, isotopes in there. Um, it's a very fun material, it's physically very heavy, Put something like an anvil inside and leave it would float, but we've never tried to remove any tender. Um, and then we look at that, all that liquid scintillator with uh, various light detectors at the top and bottom called photomultiplier tubes, and they look through this array at the top. Okay, um, we take this detector and we put it inside a tin, kit, the tin can, but I'm a bit uh, tiny, really. And then we put that inside another detector around the outside. We fill this with um, a liquid which glows when any particle goes into it. So that, again, it's trying to protect ourselves from radiation coming in from the outside, detect it before it gets into the middle. And then we take all of this and put it inside <coughs> another, another layer of shielding. We fill this tank with ultra, ultra pure water. Put, put your hand in it, you burn your hand, because it'll, be, it'll just leach out all the um, material, you know, whatever it is on your hand, it burns it from leaching it. Um, and then we go, and all of this is done while on the ground. So you can see the extreme lengths that we're going to to try and get rid of all this, these other types of radiation. 
So here's our generic, generic detector particle. Hopefully, your little particle, particle comes in, generates a little flash of light for various technical reasons. You then get another flash of light at the top. We analyze all those signals, look what we, look what we can see. So we've removed all the, or shielded all the sources of radiation that we know about. We can't shield ourselves from dark matter. Dark matter is, is properties that just moves through everything. So we're basically looking to see whether or not we've removed all the radiation. If we're still seeing something, that might be dark matter. How well have we done? Well, a few months ago, we released our first results. And we're delighted to see that those are the world's best. So we are world leaders in this at the moment. Um, and to try and quantify what we've done, well, we ran, I said it had about 10 tons of liquid xenon. We use about five and a half ten tons of it because the rest of it is the outer layer, which we'd be using as another layer of shielding, essentially, to, to make sure that the central volume is as pure as possible. Central volume is about five and a half tons of liquid xenon. We ran it for uh, two months, but well, I actually ran it for about three months, but you don't run it all the time because there are various collaboration procedures you have to do. So the total time we effectively ran it was 60 days. And in all that time, we saw about three, well, we saw fewer, three or fewer dark matter events. Um, I've got to use that technical language because there's various, uh, the statistics of it get slightly complicated, but we saw three or fewer events, um, not enough to claim discovery. So not enough to even have a hint of discovery. Um, okay, um, how do I put this in context? Well, I mentioned earlier that each of us has natural radiation in us, which is generating about 5,000 radioactive decays a second. So if I took enough people, put them in a grinder, and added up enough people to make uh, five and a half tons, um, I'd probably get a prison. Um, <laughs> but I could do that, and I would have however much radiation five and a half tons would make. Uh, I could run all of that for 60 days, each of those uh, humans, one human amount generating 5,000 Ks per second, add that up. Um, so a single human has about 5,000 radioactive Ks per second. If the detector, LZ, Dr. Zeppelin, were made of humans, we would have seen roughly 2 trillion events. So that's how much more, and that's not including cosmic rays and things, which we've got rid of as well by going deep underground. So, I think we're doing fairly well at trying to make a really sensitive, uh, pure detector that doesn't see other stuff, but it still isn't enough to see the dark matter at the moment. Okay, what's happening next? Um, well, first of all, we've only just turned on the detector. We're still running. Um, <laughs> we've got about 17 times as much data yet to collect, uh, so we should get much, much more sensitive results soon. Hopefully, that will be a positive detection. There are theoretical models which tell us the kind of area where we think we should start seeing a signal, and we're right in that sweet spot at the moment. There's every chance that we might not see something very soon, which would be fantastic. If we do see something, then we'll have seen a few events. We want thousands of events so that we can start really characterizing what's going on. So we'll need a bigger, better detector. If we don't see anything, well, we'll need a bigger, better detector to try and go a bit further. Um, there are plans very much afoot to do this. Uh, our detector is this LZ one. There's another collaboration called uh, Xenon, which is the X, and there's another one called Darwin. Get the world's best collaborators all together to make one super experiment. And the idea is to really build the ultimate one of these detectors that then wouldn't be any further. People often say, we just keep going and going and going forever for technical reasons as well as cost reasons, you probably wouldn't. So, this is the plan to make the, the world's best piece of detector. Well, this is a plan which is I think very likely to happen. There's really compelling evidence, really comp compelling case for it. We're starting to put it together now. We're going to find the agencies fairly soon. The center we're running at the moment, we've got about another three, four, five years, something like that to run it. Then we'll be looking for something else. Um, it's not determined where this could go. One obvious question is could it come here in the UK? And there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm to do this. It's been since the 1950s or so since we've had a, a UK based. Um, experiment of anything like this uh, size, size and stuff. And you think of all this um, um, world of science superpower type stuff. This is the detector for a science superpower. And there's all this leveling up agenda. And the northeast of England is really deprived. And it'd be really good to the, the science input that this would have a little bit sensible, for example. And the, the impact it has on the local community. This would be so good. So here's, uh, well, here we are up in Shetland. There's Paul Bean around about there. 
Um, if we could do this, it would be the first world-class science under the UK soil for a long, long time. We would hopefully inspire a new generation of scientists. And well, we've been touring in lots of schools today and I've been really emphasising to them the time to get over this matches the kids of today growing up and starting doing some of this stuff. We'd be really excited if they could get involved in this. And with that, I think that's about it. I want to thank my collaborators in the various 36 different places around the world, spanning the UK, the US, uh, Portugal, Korea, and Australia, and funding agencies that thankfully give us enough money to do this stuff and have lots of fun. With that, I'll say thank you. What we're going to do in the remaining time is just to um, invite you all um, to give us some questions. But the only one I'd like to start with is that uh, we began by sharing a bit of history with us, telling us about the Lord Kelvin and uh, Peter Rubin and Fritz Sticky and Bobby Plunkery. But I'd really like to ask you about a bit of your own history and just in terms of your early history, we talked a lot about school kids in the last couple of days. It was great to see their enthusiasm. What point was it good to see when you got more enthusiastic about science and about physics? Um, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I kind of did. My sister did a physics degree right. um, at the University of Birmingham, and she came home. She's seven years older than me, and she told me all these things about what was going around in circles and stuff. Um, and I really hope this doesn't sound conceited, but it, it all sounds so simple to me and obvious. A lot of what we did at A level was really mind numbing and boring. And I, I, what you're doing now, you're helping lead redevelop the curriculum in schools for something a bit more interesting. Back in the late 1980s, it was tick um, and take timers. I mean, that is a word that haunts anyone from before. It's just bland and boring and obvious and easy to get aim at least. Um, maths was more interesting than that, I love the it. So I went for the easy option and went for um, physics, which is quite funny because I've, I've had similar discussions to this with Catherine Edmonds, so if you're a strong girl of Scotland. And if you ask her why she did physics, it's because she saw it as the most difficult, intractable problems out there. She really wanted to challenge herself. And I'm completely a different person. <laughs> Well, forgive you for that because I know you were enthusiastic about Star Wars, so yeah, <laughs> that's almost as good. And um, anyway, can I turn to the audience? Does anyone have any questions for Alex? He's uh, sorry, he's a former country expert. Yeah. The three events you found in that, uh, we didn't find okay. So, what it is yeah. is that we have um, we get all this background, right? All this radiation, so there's still noise coming through, and there's yeah. still some noise coming through, but it's not that matter. But isn't well. Unfortunately, you can't say yes no to these things. You have a essentially you essentially have a number line. It's a little bit more complicated, but essentially you have a number line, and there's a whole bunch of events over here which are from gamma rays and these particles. Um, we know that those can't be dark matter. Um, our dark matter events should occur over here because of the various properties of it. Um, but your gamma rays and these particles they make a, a sort of blob like this, and this blob extends, and it's we didn't see anything over here, but maybe there could have been some props over there or something. So it's, it becomes a slightly statistical game that you have to play. So all we can say is that there's three or fewer. Um, if there were more than that, then they would have given us a, a signal. But is there a three or fewer and we could energy say. you're looking for? Particular energy or mass? mass energy. Um, so this is the result for testing the with the interactive mass of particle hypothesis. And that's testing uh, these WIMPs, which have masses between about, well, I'm going to say 1 G the over C squared up to about 10 to, 10 to 5 G the over C squared, which is a unit which means nothing. It's about, it's about sort of the mass of a proton, if that means anything, up to about 10,000 of the mass of a proton. Um, so it's a bit like a, a proton, but which doesn't, again, I showed you the standard model type thing. It would be a, something a bit like a proton, but which doesn't have a strong nuclear force, doesn't have a um, uh, electromagnetic force, but for some reason would have a weak interaction. Um, and these these wimps are, there's various theoretical models, the most famous one possibly you've heard of is uh, SUSY, supersymmetry, known as SUSY, which is a, so we get, we've got this model of the standard model with 17, um, arguably more because a lot of them have antiparticles, fundamental particles, which is a hell of a complicated thing, why it's so complicated? Well, supersymmetry, 
makes it even more complicated by saying that every one of these has another partner over here. Why would you want to make it more complicated? Well, in doing so, it gives you an understanding of why it has that structure it does. So you can, you can come up with this model which tells you why you have these 17 different particles. Unfortunately, the consequence is you've got another 17 particles as well. So is it progress? I'm not sure. Um, the lightest of those would be a really good dumbass candidate, is why it's interesting. Okay, it would have all the right properties. Um, but uh, that's a theory, and it's, it's been around for a while. Uh, it was really hoped when LHC was turned on that um, this supersymmetry would just shine like a light bulb on it. It would be uh, the first thing to be seen. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of uncertainty in all the different parameters that can go into supersymmetry. And there's nothing to say that you had to have it phasable. Uh, the nature has clearly not been particularly kind to us. Supersymmetry could still be the right answer, but all the dials, for some reason, have been turned down to near zero. Or maybe it's something like extra dimensions, or who knows. Um, but whatever it is, we need dark matter, and it's not the standard model. There's one of these crazy, weird, wonderful theories is right. Will we ever find out which one it is? I hope so. So we have another question. I'll mm -hmm. just do a very quick follow-up to that one and then straight to you. So uh, you noted that you're currently model bleeding in terms of consensus that came out at all. So um, does that place any interesting constraints yet on some of that? Oh massively. Like, massively, right? Like, so um yeah, the so when it actually turned on it was hoped that you'd see supersymmetry really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um well it didn't, and so you ruled out a load of the possibilities for the particular Type of supersymmetry there might be. Equally, right now we are carving away into it's known as the parameter space. It's um, you essentially all your models have so one value of something which could vary up and down here, and one value could vary up and down there, and of course up and down here, fourth dimension, fifth dimension, whatever. And so that's a parameter space, and you kind of cut away what's left, but we're cutting away um, massively with these detectors. But uh, there are there are also I should. For fairness, um, there are theories which um, would suggest that we will never see anything. Um, if there's, uh, so a critical one is, I mentioned about quantum mechanics and general relativity. Well, maybe gravity, at the moment we kind of think gravity is a different kind of force and it's generated by um, the curvature of space time the event. But there's quantum gravity where gravity is propagated much like light is, and light is Photons bouncing around. Maybe gravity is being propagated by gravitinos, as they're known. If dark matter is a sort of heavy gravitino, then it'll have no weak interaction. It's only got gravity. You've seen the gravity, there's nothing else. If that's the case, then all of our detectors are doomed. Um, which is kind of weird. It seems unlikely, um, but it's possible. And well, that's, that's the way we, we can't tell nature what to do. Um, we have only hope. She's kind to us at one point. Mm -hmm. sure. um, thank you. It's been a really interesting talk. I think I've probably understood about 3% of it. Oh, no. What, no, 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 not your fault. Yeah. My fault. My question no, really is awesome. what do I do so next time you come, I'll get maybe 5 6%? What should I, what should oh, I do as time that work? That's a great question. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back to that at the end if you'd like. No, what? So, I'm a, I'm a particle astrophysicist at heart in this. So I'm really trying to merge this particle physics with astrophysics. And for that, you need to understand a little bit more about the, the particle physics side of things. So go away, find out what the standard model is, and have a look at a few of those things. Because it's, um, and, and then try and understand why it is that dark matter can't be part of the standard model. And in doing so, I'm sure you'll learn an awful lot about what dark matter could be. Um, Thank you. And I think that's really, and, and more than that, again, I try and emphasize this to undergraduates, and I think most of you get it, is that it puts you in a very privileged position, I would say, compared to many people in the public who just, things happen and they don't bother thinking about why they happen. Whereas I can look at how a storm happens and you get uh, cyclones and anti-cyclones and things. And I know why it's doing that and why it's not just blowing in a straight line. And it, I, I, I take a lot of enjoyment out of that. Um, so I, I think there's 
by spending a bit of effort trying to understand what's going on on a fundamental level, it really helps. To go and learn about the standard model. Yeah, you may hate me, but <laughs> <laughs> I promise I will. Do we have any Oh, also, find out about Zwicky, what he was really like. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, I have a couple of questions which are which are related. Going back to um, the earlier diagram that you used, the, the showing the estimate of the of the, the makeup of the universe. Mm -hmm. So, um, dark energy aside at the moment, if we think that all matter, roughly matter as we see it and perceive it, is roughly estimated to be about five percent, right? Yeah, and the other ninety five percent estimated to be dark matter, but when you using, well, for example, when you, you use the picture of Andromeda, um, and you used uh, an example about saying obviously that the, in, the gravitational interaction within a galaxy, for example, allowed you to to create a model um, that gave you an idea of what's missing. You're missing ninety five percent, but is that model not based on our understanding of matter as we can as we see it? So what I mean is like, for example, with um, you use the, the you had this the standard particle model there with the Higgs boson, which provides mass. So, if um, what if because we we don't know what the, the particle makeup of dark matter is, is it possible then that it's less numerous but has more mass and has uh, the same gravitational force? Well, yes. So, um, I, I mentioned earlier that we're searching for these weights. So that's kind of the principle we want to look for, and it might be something around that. Um, the mass of a proton, or it might be something 10,000 times the mass of a proton. If it's the mass of a proton, there's 10,000 times more of those particles than there are if there's one of these heavier particles floating around. So yes, you sort of have to conserve the total amount of uh, weight out there that must be floating around. Um, the, how do we do this? It's also quite uh, informative to realise that the our galaxy uh, or if you go back in <coughs> history of the universe, Big Bang explodes, um, and the dark matter we think was produced in the Big Bang, just like all of our normal particles were, except all of our normal, um, everything else is produced as well. All of those particles in the standard model, they all get produced. If Susie's correct, all of these other particles in supersymmetry are correct. But fairly quickly, everything decays, like, decays down to the lightest particles that it can be. So most of the stuff around us is made of neutrons and protons because those are pretty much stable. Um, neutrons are actually unstable, but when you put them inside a the nucleus, they become stable again for crazy nuclear physics reasons. Um, but the dark matter has nothing like to, to decay into, so it's still just sitting there. And it's been sitting there since the Big Bang, basically. Our galaxy has actually formed in the places in the universe where the dark matter is, is already. So it's not that the galaxy forms and the dark matter falls into it, it's the other way around. The, the universe earlier was made of dark matter distributed all over the place. Slightly heavier, but slightly more dense bits is where the normal matter is then fallen into to make galaxies. So the dark matter is spread, the very first image I think I have, that's sort of the, the simulation of the dark matter across the universe. It's much more evenly spread across the universe um, with all these filaments and wet type things. And it's where you get those slightly more dense patches there. The normal galaxies form those those sort of potential worlds. Okay. I'm not sure if I've explained anything at all to you, but that's yes. the well, second question, yeah. like, which is kind of relates to that, was about dark energy. So I've always understood it that our energy as we perceive it, as we understand it, as we can as we can model it, um, and as you know, as we can like tangible energy comes from matter as we know, right? So is there is do you see dark energy um, in complete isolation, or do you think it could have a relationship with dark energy since we can't see it like the dark matter? Yeah. Right, so all the dark matter and dark energy related. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a fundamental question. Yeah. Um, ah, probably not, as in uh, dark matter seems to be the thing that holds galaxies together and stops them flying apart because they're spinning around so fast. Dark energy seems to be this thing which is making Galaxies separated from one another fly apart from one another more, more, more rapidly. That said, um, I can't be certain. I mean, are they related? There's, there's very, very early in the universe. Um, so after the Big Bang explodes, it's thought that there was a period of what's known as inflation, 
and this is happening at a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. Um, there's not really the evidence for that is that when you look at the universe on large, on large scales, you kind of have to come up with an idea like that to explain why it's so uniform in all the different directions. Um, but a universe which is expanding really quickly, well, right now we've got a universe with dark energy in it, which is expanding ever and ever faster. Are those two bits related to one another? It's very tempting to think so. Nobody's come up with a theory that makes it work yet, um, but it's possible. And dark matter is another component somewhere in the middle, which is, it, it's, um, quite a few people say that there's a crisis in cosmology at the moment. We've got all of this great information, and it, it doesn't hang together. You can, you can take, take Einstein's uh, relativity, you take quantum mechanics, you take um, large-scale structure, and, and it, there's lots of different things. We invoke dark matter for one thing, we invoke dark energy for another thing, we invoke uh, inflation in the very early universe. They don't work together very well. Um, there, there's, I'm personally fairly convinced that at some point, Another Einstein is going to come along and say, "We fools! It was this all along, <laughs> and suddenly everything will start working together." That said, exactly that thought has been around before. Um, the uh, I think it was it was it even Lord Kelvin? I'm not sure. He said that physics is dead. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Well, this is really what he said. I mean, I struggle to find definitive proof there. Right. It sounds like the kind of thing you would have said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's consistent with what you would use it. Right. I mean, so. People before have thought that they've like, done physics. Right now, we're just a million miles away from that. Um, will we ever get there again? Who knows? Will they be right? Probably not. <laughs> Any more questions? We, we're almost out of time, but time for maybe two more. So, yep. I was just wondering, firstly, um, the results you've got from the detector, do you think that, that will actually prove whether you need a bigger detector or whether you know, actually Waste the time trying to do it that way. And secondly, if you prove the dark matter, if somebody proves that dark matter exists, what is the benefit to mankind? Um, right. Um, so we we can, if nature's kind, we will be able to get results which are pretty definitive that this is dark matter. We've seen it, and um, with the current generation of instruments, we would be able to. Definitively say, yes, we've got that matter. Um, if we do that, we still probably can't say that much about the characteristics of dark matter because you've just got a few events um, and for various reasons. You don't get one event and sort of look at it in detail. You've got bing, that was it, it's gone. Um, you need to start seeing many of them and seeing how they behave in the in 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 whole. So we would still, to, to, well, the other thing is that this is one technique, there's other techniques that you with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, with other colliders, you can do with uh, space telescopes looking at stuff. Uh, there's related research going on with gravitational waves and things. So there's, there's lots of other ways, and hopefully two or three different techniques start seeing something, and we can see that they're correlating to one, together with one another. We we'll really get good understanding of what's going on. So even if we see something, it's not the end of the story. Um, sorry, your second question remind yeah. me. What would be the benefit? Uh, what's the benefit to mankind? Um, uh, and, uh, who was it who said, um, what's the good of the light? What's the good of uh, the new world baby? Something like that. Yeah. As mentioned in Frank, there we go. Thank you. You're going to give a history side this lately. Okay, so we know we've seen running a detector for 60 days. Um, we've seen three or which, which weighs five and a half tons or something, um, we've seen uh, fewer than three events. Each of those events, if it, if it has happened, has dumped into our detector a tiny amount of energy. So, okay, let's scale this up. Instead of running this for um, <coughs> only one second, but instead of using our detector, let's use the entire planet, all of the planet Earth, and make it 100% um, efficient. If you collected all of that energy, it wouldn't run a light bulb. Uh, it wouldn't even run an LED light. It's a tiny amount of energy. So the chances of us getting a useful amount of energy out of dark matter uh, is very tempting to say to Neil. I never say no, but there's just um, this doesn't interact much. So the sort of practical usage of dark energy, you're not going to get spaceships which are powered by dark energy, it just isn't going to happen, or dark matter, just not going to happen. Right? 
Um, however, what you will get is whatever that next step in physics is, you'll get an inkling as to what it is. And if there's a, another, so if you've got how well we've done at the moment with our normal, with our standard model of particle physics with all different particles that are in there, if we can open up this other universe, then that would be breaking into a new area of physics, which maybe somewhere in there, there will be things that will be really practical and useful. What it will be, I really couldn't guess at the moment. Um, I look forward to finding out. It will be whatever it is I'm convinced there will be something useful in there. It will tell us new ways of doing medical physics, new ways of running the internet, new ways of keeping people make lots of money. Um, it will be, it is worth doing it purely for the um, economic value, but it's going to be a long time until we find out what that is. Anybody else? Any final question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Einstein uh, had to use the uh, cosmological constant in his equation to, um, to account for the fact that the universe was yep. yeah. so, yeah. uh, I understand that it's actually the cosmo cosmological constant uh, has taken on a new uh, significance now with dark match and dark energy. Uh, how important that was, or it's just like. So it's. So this is really much more in uh, Martin's field, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, um, in trying to work out, so uh, one of the interesting things in physics is that um, let's take some space and pull everything out of it, everything, 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 and you're left with a perfect vacuum. If you were to take a freeze frame of that and you're able to see it, you would see that it's absolutely crowded with, with particles. Um, so spontaneously, in vacuum, particles and antiparticles are appearing, and then they um, find each other and they annihilate again. This is like Hawking radiation going around black holes and all that stuff. Um, our best theory is that if you were to able freeze frame it and you look at at that instant, you've got all these particles and antiparticles. Well, they still have weight. You add up all the weight of all those particles. Is that what dark energy is? Is that somehow what it's what's working? Well, the mathematics for that comes out as 120 orders of magnitude incorrect. Um, it's the worst prediction in science. And 120 orders of magnitude, um, what do I mean by that? Well, if I take, let's say, one millimeter, tiny little distance, one millimeter, three orders of magnitude, what more, gives me one meter. Six orders of magnitude just give me a kilometer. Nine orders of magnitude just give us ten kil uh, a thousand kilometers. I'm only up to nine, right? You're going to get to 120. It's bigger than the size of the universe. It's it, it's 120 orders of magnitude. It's a phenomenally bad prediction, um, which is one of the really interesting because it should be there as well. <laughs> that's that's it's, the, it's one of the greatest problems in physics, actually. That one. Um, why am I going into this? Um, dark. So the cosmological constant is kind of like that, um, but for some reason it would have to be. Much, much lighter. Is there a reason why you can have a, a cosmological constant that can do that? There are various ways that you can make it happen. But there are other mechanisms as well. There's, there's a really nice one at the moment is some um, holographic theory, where it's um, more about the, the way that the information content of the universe is distributed. That, that information, just the fact that things are happening, has kind of an energy density associated with it as well. And maybe that's what um, dark energy is. But it's um, it's really hard to come up with a theory of dark energy which puts this energy into the universe that doesn't just completely swamp it. And the other thing is you need something which makes space expand and accelerate in its expansion. If you put normal energy into the universe, it, 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 it's something physical and it makes it get smaller. So there's something really weird about dark energy. And there's many other weird things about dark energy as well. It's only been dominating the expansion of the universe for the last five billion years out of its age of 13.8 billion years. Why did it only start coming along recently? Why are we here to be in this rather unexpected period where, so if you imagine all of time from creation to end of the universe, um, from almost all of it, dark, end, dark matter would have dominated. For, and then, so, yeah, for a period you know, you know, dark matter dominating, then at some particular point it looks like dark energy completely takes over. We happen to live just at the moment when one fourth fades away and the other one comes in. <coughs> That's what it seems to be, though. 
Sadly, we've come to the end of the evening, and the way you know something I often say to my undergrad students, you probably do the same to yours, that um, we now know less about the universe than we thought we did when I was a student. And I hope it's not also the case that we now know less about that matter than we thought we did at the start of the lecture. But if that is true, we have still done our job because, in a way, that's what's so fascinating about the universe right now is that there are so many big questions to address. And that's very much the spirit of what we've been doing with this, the school pupils, inspire them to become the next generation scientists. I hope we've inspired you a little bit as well. Um, so, there's a few people in fact, but first of all, let's thank Alex for the fact that we've done I'd also like to thank the schools in Shetland that have given us such a warm welcome. Uh, to the museum and archives here, and to uh, our colleagues at the staff who you know, uh, hosted us and helped us with a few empathy problems along the way, but, but we got there. A special one of thanks to Paul Bendix from the Shetland Science Outreach Group, who's been a wonderful host. I first met Paul 10 years ago when I came before to give some in person lectures, but he also gave us great help in arranging the online ones last year, so very good to see him again. And most of all, let's thank all of you for coming along and joining us in this evening. So, thank you.